Good morning. Oh, wow, that was awesome. I love that. I could hear all these voices come back. Okay, so uh, um, we're going to do some announcements at the end of the service. So uh, just wanted to mention there, in case you did not hear, there's no potluck today. We, we pushed it off to we're going to do an all-church picnic on in two weeks, and uh, it's going to be June 4th. Um, and it's the day that uh, we're going to do an all-church survey with uh, Converge and, um, and then go to, on the picnic. And we'll be announcing, we'll be giving you a little more information after the service. Let's stand up and let's worship the Lord.
Lord, we welcome you into this place this morning. And Lord, we just come with all kinds of uh, things probably in our daily lives that uh, uh, can challenge us. And Lord, uh, we just come and we want to meet here with you. We want to hear your voice. We want to worship you. We want to bow at your feet. We want to speak the name. Jesus, I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind, because I know there is peace within your presence, I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over fear and all anxiety To every soul held captive by depression I speak Jesus Your name is power in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name of Jesus sing it again shout Jesus from the mountain Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every end. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. Sing it one more time. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. shadows burn like a fire sing it again your name is power your name is 
Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, with everything around me shaking. I've never been more glad. I put my faith in Jesus, because He's never. Let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got that makes no sense so I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength cause I built my life on Jesus he's never let me down he's faithful in every season so He won't. No, he won't. He won't. He won't fail. He won't fail. He won't. He won't. Put my 
began to breathe out of the silence. 
said, Amen. You may be seated. I want to release the kids now to go to Children's Church. And the kids, you can make your way to the back. And I uh, want to call the ushers forward as we uh, go into our time of giving back to the Lord in our tithes and offerings as an act of worship. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you that you're a living hope, and Lord, we just now turn back to you on tithes and offerings in Jesus' name. Amen. I am so glad to be back for another week with you. I have had a fantastic week here in the Pacific Northwest. Thank you for ordering up a beautiful week of weather. Much appreciated, and I can't take that for granted, can you? Uh, my wife and I, Anna, uh, we grew up in Colorado, and then we lived in the South for 26 years. And uh, then we got to move here to the Pacific Northwest and then down to California. But we loved the beauty of the Pacific Northwest and the Pacific Coast. But what we loved the most were the incredible trees. Uh, the old growth Douglas firs and down in California, the giant sequoia redwood forests. Incredible. Uh, some of those giant sequoias are over 300 feet tall. And it's a football field. And some of them are over 2,000 years old. I mean, past the time of Christ on earth, these trees have been there. And you would think that such an enormous tree would have a root system that just goes 
deep into the earth to anchor it, much like we would build a skyscraper with a really deep foundation. But you'd actually be wrong. The root system on the redwoods is not super deep. It's actually kind of shallow. But what happens is they intertwine their roots together. And it's the intertwining that gives all those trees the strength to withstand the storms that roll through. And together, they grow strong. Whereas individually, they wouldn't be able to make it. And the same is true of us. God has made us for community. His intentional design for the church is for us to nourish and support each other. And in the mission statement here for Edgewood, uh, you have the words loving God and loving others, uh, which comes directly from the great commandment in Matthew 22. And this morning, we're going to focus on that idea of loving others and more specifically on the idea of biblical community uh, with one another right here inside the church. We will unpack what God has to say about the idea of community, why it's so important, and uh, why we sometimes resist it. And my goal for our time is to help you identify whether or not you're experiencing genuine community the way God intended it, and then to encourage us all to take our next step forward in pursuing it. So let's pray and commit the, our time to the Lord. Father, thank you. Thank you for designing each one of us to live in community. And uh, Lord, I ask that you would help me to faithfully and clearly teach your word this morning. And I ask that you would help each one of us to hear your voice as we seek to obey. Father, be glorified in this time. It's in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. Well, as I said, God has made each one of us for community. The church is meant to be a place where we are truly known by others. In his book, The Connecting Church, Randy Frazee writes this, the experience of authentic community is one of the purposes God intends to be fulfilled by the church. The writings of scripture lead one to conclude that God intends the church not to be just one more bolt on the wheel of activity in our lives, but to be the very hub at the center of one's life. So let's look and see what God's word has to say about the value of community. Uh, first, scripture warns of the danger of isolation. And you see this in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. It, re it says this, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either one of them falls, the, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. And then skipping ahead to verse 12, a cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. Two are better than one, Scripture says. Uh, as a kid... I used to remember watching National Geographic on television. I suppose that dates me, dates you too, if you remember. So, uh, uh, but what I liked watching the most was the lions when they were on a hunt. Um, what's the tactic that a lion uses when, when he's hunting? He tries to isolate one from the rest of the herd. And if the lion can do that, then the chances of a successful hunt are very high. Um, in the same way, Peter uses the imagery of a lion to describe the enemy of, enemy of our souls. And he says in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. 
your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, which is much more likely if you're isolated. One thing I've observed in the church over the years is a great number of believers living uh, a Christian life that is lonely and in isolation. They may be in close proximity to other believers, much like we are this morning. We're in proximity of one another. But when it comes to any kind of meaningful interaction, many feel alone. And the Christian life is not meant to be a lone ranger experience. It's a team thing. So scripture warns us about isolation. And secondly, the second way we see God has designed us for community is found in the creation account of Genesis 1 and 2. There's a pattern that we see there where God would create something and then pronounce it that it was good. It was good, it was good, it was good. And then we get to chapter 2, verse 18, and something in God's perfect creation is not Good. And it's, uh, it stands out like a shining beacon there in the text. And what is that? Well, it says, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. And so God created Eve, giving the gift of intimate relationship to mankind. And even though the specific context there is marriage, I think it goes beyond that to describe that we are designed for relationship. And why do I think that? Well, it has to do some with the the nature of God himself. And that's uh, our third point, that God himself lives in community. Community is rooted in the very nature of God. Scripture reveals that God exists In Trinity, three persons in one Godhead. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit have eternally existed in a beautiful relationship with each other. And as image bearers of God, we reflect this aspect as we live in community as well. Dallas Willard puts it this way. God's aim in human history is the creation of an inclusive community of loving persons with himself included as its primary sustainer and most glorious inhabitant. And then four, another way we see God's heart for community is that he repeatedly commands it. Uh, we see this in the many variations of the one another Commands. The phrase one another is repeated nearly 60 times in the New Testament in the form of a command. And they give us a special sense of the kind of life that God intends together. And in this next slide, you will see uh, the, the breadth of the, uh, which you can't hardly see, um, and, and that's okay. I didn't intend for you to really read this slide. I just wanted you to see this, the, the repeated nature of the one another commands. And you'll see that in this list, uh, the church is called to, to love one another and be at peace with one another and serve and carry each other's burdens and forgive and encourage and offer hospitality and, and many more. And so we can see how important these community-related aspects are to God because he speaks of them so frequently in his word. And I got a question for you. Uh, Where do these things happen in church? Do these things happen for you in a typical Sunday morning worship service? Well, certainly some of them do, but most of these passages speak of 
really knowing each other and being involved in each other's lives. And so for most of us, it's difficult to truly experience these things in a typical Sunday morning worship service. And uh, this is one of the benefits of a small group or serving on a team together where these things are lived out with true life-on-life interaction. And I'm not discounting the importance of the worship service. I'm just saying it's not enough to experience the kind of community that God intended. And then uh, if we were going to spend a lot more time unpacking uh, with this next slide the the, uh, where we see community in Scripture, here's what I would point out, uh, but we're not going to go through these. uh, That, uh, first of all, Jesus chose to live in and model community. And then Jesus prayed that the church would experience community in John 17. The early church modeled community, and uh, Ephesians 4 points out that uh, life change happens best in the context of community, and then think of heaven. Heaven's promise is a place of perpetual community. These are all things that where we see God's design for community in Scripture. So if we're made for community, what does it mean? look like? How can you experience community the way God intended? And as a discipleship pastor, I have always tried to help our small group leaders strive for three things. Uh, That's growth, care, and mission. Genuine biblical community contains these three essential attributes, growth, care, and and mission. So let's let's unpack them. First, growth. Genuine community facilitates spiritual growth. If you're experiencing community, you are in relationship with other believers who are helping you to mature in the faith and become more like Christ. And we see that in Ephesians 4, 11 through 15. Let's read it together. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. So we see that God has gifted, he's given gifts to the body for a purpose, and that is to help others in the body to grow and to mature and to become like Christ. And uh, just very similar to the Redwoods, where our roots are supposed to intertwine, and together we're helping others in the body grow. So what is it that is your gifting that Someone else in the body needs that gift to help them grow. Uh, Eugene Peterson says it this way. There can be no maturity in the spiritual life, no obedience in following Jesus, no wholeness in the Christian life apart from an immersion in an embrace of community. I am not myself by myself. So that said, growth doesn't magically happen uh, simply because you're in community. There are a few key ingredients that uh, facilitate growth. And uh, the first key ingredient is biblical truth. Uh, That is studying God's word together. 
the key component. Did you ever polish rocks as a kid? Thank you, JJ. He was quick to raise his hand. Uh, so what happens when you put rocks in a tumbler and tumble them around and around for a, a lengthy period of time? Uh, <laughs> well, nothing happens if all you put in the tumbler is rocks. They just bounce against each other. But if you add sand into the tumbler, it acts as an abrasive and it starts to sh uh, polish the rock and bring out the beauty and the shine of each individual rock. And God's word, sp spiritual truth, is much like that in the context of community. It's that abrasive that starts to bring out the beauty of walking with Christ and maturing and becoming like Christ. Another key ingredient for growth is mutual accountability, loving accountability. And in community, you need people that love you enough to ask the hard questions. Questions like, hey, you shared last week that you were struggling with this. How's it going? Did you do the things that you said you were, that you felt God was leading you to do? It's a hard question, but a loving accountability question. And as I look back on my own experience in small groups, most of my growth as a follower of Christ has come in the context of community. Both my wife and I recognized this early on, and we made a commitment that uh, we would always be, for our, the rest of our life, in some type of small group. It's a lifestyle choice. We're committed to being in community because it helps us to grow and mature. A second attribute of genuine community is uh, care. Galatians 6.2 says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. A small group is an ideal place uh, to live this out, because in a small group you have an opportunity to share what's really going on in, uh, with a safe group of people that truly care. And this is the essence of truly being known by others. They, they know your joys, your struggles, your hurts, your temptations. And then together you build a loving and caring atmosphere. And one of the key ingredients here is praying for each other. Isn't it wonderful when you have a group of people that you know are truly praying for you. And God must in, enjoy group prayer too, because Jesus said in Matthew 18, 19, and 20, if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. So when a group is praying, God promises his presence in a way that must be something beyond his ordinary constant presence with us. And I think he says it this way, just as a point of emphasis for us to see that prayer with and for one another is cherished by God. So the first attribute of community is spiritual growth. The second is care. And then the third is mission. Helping each other to live on mission. And I've seen in most churches, uh, most small groups do really well on the first two. They help each other grow and care for one another. But they often uh, struggle with this third. They, many groups in churches get kind of focused inward. And so it's uh, the best groups, the most vibrant groups in churches are the ones that have 
that encourage an external component to uh, the life of their group. And because uh, we're, we're all sent by God on a mission to declare and tangibly demonstrate the gospel. Genuine community reminds us and calls us to a purpose outside the group. Hebrews 10.24 is another one of those one another verses. And it says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. So we're told, first of all, to consider, or in other words, to be intentional and purposeful about how to stir up one another. And uh, sometimes that's translated to spur one another or to provoke one another. Uh, the, the original word carries the idea of agitating or prodding and I think that's kind of accurate uh, because the truth is that living in community can sometimes be irritating. Uh, and if you're not irritated, maybe you're the one that's irritating the others. Uh, but um, do you remember uh, from the 1990s, the Biosphere 2? It was this... Uh, big glass dome where they were going to create the perfect atmosphere with just the right amount of light and soil and oxygen and water, purified air and all this stuff. And it was going to be the ideal sustainable environment for plants and vegetables and humans to, to live in. Well, it, it failed on a number of levels. But uh, one of the things that surprised the scientists was that the trees would, uh, would grow up and they'd get to a certain maturity and they would just then fall over. And it kind of baffled them for a while and then they realized the one natural element that they had left out of the biosphere is wind. It's wind that blows against the trees and ends up creating what they call stress wood and it allows the, the tree to be strengthened and grow deeper roots and then grow taller and get more uh, light and all the things that allow the, the tree to grow tall. And that is similar to me uh, to that value of prodding or stirring up one another. It's like wind uh, for the trees. It, it creates stress wood. It helps prod and stir us on to what? To love and good deeds. Uh, it's an outward focus. It helps us to be on mission, uh, doing the things that matters to God. Uh, so there's a few key ingredients uh, that you see for um, being on mission, uh, being involved in service, uh, and then being uh, encouragers to one another. So these are the three attributes of genuine community that you know you're experiencing community when you're experiencing growth, when you're experiencing care for one another, and you are encouraging one another to be on mission. So in a few minutes, I'm going to ask you, are you experiencing community in this way? And um, when you hear it described this way, we all want that. But why is it so hard? Why do we resist it? And I think there's a number of reasons, and let's see if any of these are true for you. Uh, first and foremost, the fall. And there's the next slide, yeah. Uh, the fall, though we're created by God for a community, our fallen sin nature has corrupted God's design. And Adam and Eve, 
When they sinned, they hid themselves from each other with fig leaves, and they hid themselves from God, and we do the same. Sin tempts us to hide from God and each other. Secondly, our culture is just obsessed with individualism. We prize our independence. We like to be self-sufficient and to do it our own way. And uh, that might be a cultural value, but it's not a biblical one. Biblical community is countercultural. And because of that, we're going to have to work hard to create a different kind of culture in the church and in our own lives. The third reason we resist community is because it's uncomfortable. It's messy. Uh, Sharing transparently with others can take us out of our comfort zone. You run the risk of getting hurt. And you're going to have people in your group that are very different from you. And um, maybe you won't even like them at first. But uh, in God's kingdom, though, it's often our differences that end up adding richness to our experience of community. And when we then become unified, it's in spite of our differences, it's really a glorious, supernatural, God-glorifying kind of thing. The fourth reason we resist community is because it's inconvenient. Close relationships like we're describing require a high level of commitment. And uh, often when you don't feel like going out, you've got to go somewhere to be in community. And uh, if you're flaky in your commitment, you're never going to develop the kind of community that we're describing here. A fifth reason is impatience. The payoff is not immediate. It takes a long time of investing in a group to experience the kind of benefit that we're describing here requires perseverance to reap the reward of community. The sixth reason we resist is because of poor prioritization. You may know that you need to be in community, but you've allowed other things to get in the way. Maybe it's work or kids' activities, or maybe you'd rather have another uh, evening of being entertained by something on television, but... Whatever it is, biblical community just doesn't have the priority it should. Or perhaps it's procrastination. You just haven't got around to it yet. Um, Want to, haven't done it yet. So whatever it is, maybe it's something else, but uh, it's holding you back. And so, as I said earlier, the, the goal for this morning is to help us to discern whether or not we're experiencing community the way God intended. So I'll ask you, are you? Are you experiencing community the way God intended? If your answer is yes, then that's wonderful. Uh, Is there anything that you could do to take it up to another level? Is there something that you could do to talk with others in your community, that group, to take it to another level of really getting to an even better experience of community? And if your answer is no, you're not experiencing that community, I... I, uh, Perhaps some of these different factors that I just talked about are building a wall in your life and it's time to knock down the wall and to pursue in relationships and the sense of community the way God has intended it. But uh, at the end of the day, you have to make a choice to pursue it, to, uh, to consider, as the Hebrews said, to to be intentional about it. So to conclude our time, I'm going to have Jeff come back up, but I'm going to read a story for us. 
It was a dark season of the soul for Gary. And he eventually just stopped coming to church. The pastor decided to visit him one chilly winter evening. The pastor found Gary at home alone, sitting before a blazing fire. Guessing the reason for the pastor's visit, Gary welcomed him in and led him to a comfortable chair near the fireplace and waited. And the pastor made himself at home but said nothing. And in the silence that followed, he contemplated the dance of the flames around the burning logs. And after some minutes, the pastor took the fire tongs and carefully picked up a brightly burning ember and placed it to one side of the hearth all alone. Then... He sat back in his chair, still silent. Gary watched all this in quiet contemplation, and uh, he watched the one lone ember have a momentary glow, but the flame flickered and diminished, and then its fire was no more. Soon the once hot ember became cold. Not a word had been spoken since the initial greeting, and the pastor glanced at his watch and realized it was now time to leave. But then he slowly stood up, picked up the cold, dead ember, and placed it back in the middle of the fire. And immediately it began to glow once more with the light and warmth of the burning coals around it. And as the pastor reached to the door to leave, Gary absorbed the lesson and said, thank you so much for your visit and especially the fiery sermon. (laughs) I'll see you next Sunday. So being alone is not a good place to be. We're made by God to live in community. So let's pursue it by trusting God and stepping into it. Amen. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm going to play off of uh, Tom's message. It was awesome, and it's so awesome to have Tom and to see Tom again after uh, we go back 40 years, and uh, it's, it's been great. I want to ask you to look in your bulletin right now. And uh, get the connection card if you have a bulletin. If you don't, grab one on your way out. There's a uh, place right there, Life Groups in the Fall. Okay? So uh, next week is Memorial Day, correct? Okay, summer's here and summer will be gone before we know it. We are starting Life Groups back up in the fall. So here's what I want some information from you is... It says, I'm interested in life groups in the fall, and then I want to add one thing. I'm interested in hosting a life group. So we want to have life groups. If if you're in Muckleteo, we want to have a Muckleteo life group. We want to have an Edmonds life group. Maybe we'll have a Whidbey Island life group. So, uh, um, But we really want to move in that direction um, and, and to see God just continue to increase community here because we need it so badly so um anyway fill that out please fill that out um uh i'm going to mention also going to mention june 4th is another opportunity for community but in our morning service uh our district head nate will be here to to preach and we, we will be filling out a survey for our our new senior pastor and so want to encourage you to come to the service on June 4th this is is really essential uh, for us and for them to gather information and after that we will be uh, going to the beach and uh, Richmond Beach uh, bring your own picnic bring your own lawn chairs and uh, we want to run that video timer I got a great idea let's go down to Richmond Beach and check it out so like I mentioned, this uh, walkway bridge goes over the train tracks, and it's really not a bad walk at all. 
We will have people to help you if you need assistance in carrying things or help to get down here, but we will be designating a place down here um, where we can hang out together and we'll uh, <clears throat> hopefully get to do some things like plan, uh, we're gonna plan a couple games uh, in case uh, some of you would wanna participate in that and maybe some of you just wanna chill. But uh, you could even bring your dog there, so. Um, here, so anyway, you can see a slow tide, but um, we're gonna have a great time. It is after, uh, once again, after the June 4th morning service. And uh, there's my spot right there. I'm gonna have my, uh, my picnic right up there, up on whatever this, uh, <laughs> this is quite, Quite a stump there, but um, as you can see, this is the perfect location for our picnic. So anyway, how many of you been down to Richmond Beach? That's amazing. I've, I've thought I would see all the hands go up. OK, so we want to uh, organize this thing. OK, lunch. Bring your lunch for your family. Bring your lawn chairs. If you need a ride, we can talk about, uh, if we have enough people that need a ride down there, maybe we can take a van and just uh, have a designated van driver that can uh, take you down there. We also want, um, if you would have a hard time walking, it, it wasn't that really that bad, but if you have a hard time, if that's gonna be a challenge for you to walk down, we're gonna have somebody hopefully stationed to carry things for you and to help you if you need that. So community, everybody say community. Community, yeah, and um, I, I tell you, uh, I've been here 10 months, and the, the thing I appreciate the most uh, so far is, is you, <laughs> is the friendships that uh, uh, Sherry and I have already developed and talking and, and uh, interacting, and, and, and it's, been, it's been really great for us. It is, and so we want to just see that happen uh, to a greater degree for all of us. And uh, so this will be a great opportunity for us after the morning service. So write down uh, anything, say, I'm, I need a ride. Just write that down. Um, where is this place? Right? <laughs> write that down. But it's, uh, it's Saltwater Park. Let's stand up. And I'm going to pray for us. And uh, we'll be dismissed. Lord, thank you for uh, Tom's message today. We love you, Lord. And Lord, thank you that... Uh, you intend for us to be in community, and we give you praise for how you're working here. And, Lord, go with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.